Welcome to this presentation where we will take a look at the book of James, chapters 1, verses 5. So let's take a look by way of introduction. The epistle of James is well known among the members of the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints for the significant passage that led young Joseph Smith to seek for the truth from God, James 1, 5. Unlike the Apostle Paul, James did not expound much in detail upon doctrines of the gospel. Rather, this epistle provides teachings of Christian wisdom and example of how disciples of Jesus Christ should live their lives as expressions of their faith in Jesus Christ. We are to be doers of the word and not hearers only, James 1.22. Much of the counsel found in this epistle is like short sermons that emphasize righteous actions above the verbal profession of belief. James taught that true faith is manifest in one's work or actions. This letter will help readers see how to live in order to receive a crown of life. James 1.12 The epistle states that it was authored by James, a servant of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christian tradition has held that this James, like Jude, is one of the sons of Joseph and Mary, and hence half-brother of Jesus Christ. See Matthew 13.55, Mark 6.3, and Galatians 1.19. The fact that James is mentioned first in the list of Jesus' brothers in Matthew 13.55 may indicate that he was the oldest of the half-brothers. Like the Lord's other half-brother, James did not initially become a disciple of Christ. See John 7, 3-5. However, after Jesus was resurrected, James was one of those individuals to whom Christ appeared as a resurrected being. See 1 Corinthians 15, 7. Later, James became an apostle and accordingly and accordingly. According to early Christian writers, the first bishop of the Roman church in Jerusalem. As a leader in the church, he played a prominent role in the council held in Jerusalem, Acts 15.13. His influence in the church was no doubt strengthened by his kinship to Jesus, yet he showed humility in introducing himself not as the brother of Jesus, but as a servant of the Lord, James 1.1. It is difficult to determine when the epistle was written. The Jewish historian Josephus wrote that James, the brother of Jesus, was killed in A.D. 62 after the Sanhedrin ordered that he be stoned to death. Based on that information, scholars believe that James wrote this letter sometime between A.D. 45 and 60. This would make the epistle of James one of the earliest documents in the New Testament. Since James lived in Jerusalem and watched over the affairs of the church there, he likely wrote this, his epistle from that area. James is the first of the seven general epistles included in the New Testament, the others being First and Second Peter, First, Second, and Third John, and Jude. They are labeled as general epistles because their authors intended them for a broader audience than a single congregation or area. James addressed his letter to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the Twelve Apostles said the following about James' audience. Paul wrote to the saints of his own day, and in his doctrine and counsel blesses us of later years, so much the better. But James addressed himself to those of the scattered twelve tribes of Israel who belong to the church, that is, to a people yet to be gathered, yet to receive the gospel, yet to come into the fold of Christ. And if his words had import to the small cluster of saints of Judah and Benjamin who joined the church in many in time, so much the better. You can see James is writing to scattered Israel that will not be gathered for quite some time. You can almost see the Holy Ghost influencing James to write what he writes, so it will affect especially one person. That is Joseph Smith. And so the, under the inspiration, he feels like, this is for somebody in the future. I don't know who, but I'm impelled and I'm impressed to write to scattered Israel in the future. 
The epistle of James has sometimes been classified as wisdom literature, similar to the Old Testament book of Proverbs. The variety of topics mentioned may be evidence that purports of several sermons were combined to create this epistle. The text of the letter consists of short explanations of principles for Christian living. Because many of these explanations emphasize the role of righteous deeds in the justification of the believer, some believe, like Martin Luther, believe that this letter contains little about the, gospel, about the message of salvation through Jesus Christ. However, careful readers can recognize that James illustrated the need to live gospel principles in order to express one's faith in Jesus Christ. It's one thing to say you have faith. It's another one to express it by the deeds and the actions of your lives. James chapter 1, verse 1. From this verse we learn that the truths of James' letter have great application to the saints of the latter days, having been especially given especially for disciples of the latter days. With the conceivable exception of a few isolated individuals, the whereabouts of the ten tribes was unknown to James or any of the Meridian saints. The resurrected Lord told the Nephites that his people at Jerusalem did not know the location of other tribes because of their unbelief. 3 Nephi 16.4 Thus, to address an epistle to them is one thing. To put it in their hands for a pursual is quite another. It will appear that there is no way to make this delivery until the location is discovered, which may well mean that James was addressing himself in large me measure to a people who were yet in that in a distant day to be gathered to the fold of Christ. And like I said, and maybe it was addressed to one specific individual particularly, even though it affects all and has benefit to all. There is one in whom this book will have a great profound impact upon history. Certainly, the memorable fifth verse of this first chapter had more of an effect upon Joseph Smith and the destiny of the Lord's latter-day work than it did upon any person or group in the meridian of time, or I would say, even since the time of Joseph Smith. James 1, 2 through 4, for joy in afflictions. The particular nature of this epistle is evident in the opening verses. James wrote that when faith is tested or tried through difficulties, patience is produced. This patience, which leads to sanctification and spiritual development, is a necessary attribute for all who seek eternal life. Joseph Smith translation, James 1-2, changes the phrase diverse temptations to many afflictions. See James 1-2 footnote A. James 1-5, if any of you lack wisdom. Every member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has been blessed by the declaration that James made. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. This simple but inspired passage motivated the young Joseph Smith to turn to God for heavenly answer. In fact, Joseph said about these verses that, quote, Never did any passage of Scripture come with more power to the heart of man than this did at this time to mind. It seemed to enter with great force into every feeling of my heart. I reflected on it again and again knowing that if any person needed wisdom from God, I did. For how to act, I did not know. And unless I could get more wisdom than I then had, I would never know. For the teachers of the religion of the different sects understood the same passages of Scripture so differently as to destroy all confidence in settling the question by an appeal to the Bible. At length I came to the conclusion that I must either remain in darkness and confusion or else I must do as James directs, that is, ask of God. Joseph Smith History, chapter 1, verses 12 through 13. And like I said, this scripture has probably had the greatest impact on Joseph Smith than anybody ever since James has written this book. James 1.5 teaches that the heavens are not sealed. 
that God will reveal answers to those of any generation who ask in faith, including us today. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, the Quorum of the Twelve, described the unique significance of this passage for the Latter-day Saints. Quote, This single verse of Scripture has had a greater impact and a more far-reaching effect upon mankind than any other single sentence ever recorded by any prophet in any age. It might well be said that the crowning act of the ministry of James was not his martyrdom for the testimony of Jesus, but his recitation as guided by the Holy Ghost of these simple words which led to the opening of the heavens in modern times. And it might well be added that every investigator of revealed truth stands at some time in the course of his search in the place where Joseph Smith stood. He must either turn to the Almighty and gain wisdom from God by revelation if he is to gain a place on the straight and narrow path which leads to eternal life. End of quote. James 1, 6-7 What does it mean to ask in faith? James emphasized the importance of faith when asking God for answers. See also 1 Nephi 15, 11 and Moroni 10:4. Elder David A. Bednar of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained what it means to ask in faith. Quote, Notice the requirement to ask in faith, which I understand to mean the necessity to not only express but to do the dual obligation of both plead and do perform, the requirement to act, to communicate, and to act. Note the question that guided Joseph's thinking and supplication. My object in going to inquire of the Lord was to know which of all the sects was right that I might join, might wish to join. Joseph's questions focused just not on what he needed to know, but, on also, but also on what was to be done. His prayer was not simply, which church is right? His question was, which church should I join? Joseph went to the grove to ask him faith, and he was determined to act. True faith is focused in and on the Lord Jesus Christ and always leads to righteous action. We express, I apologize, we press forward and preserve in the consecrated work of prayer when we say amen by acting upon the things we have expressed to Heavenly Father. Asking in faith requires honesty, effort, commitment, and persistence. End of quote. What a beautiful example Elder Bednar gives of what it means to ask in faith. God does not answer prayers just out of mere curiosity. I must be willing to act upon the answer he's going to give me, or there is no need for him to answer the prayer. James' personal experience likely taught him this principle, because he wasn't always a believer. True disciples must not waver in their faith or commitment. This is similar in asking God with real intent. What are my intentions with the knowledge that I want the Lord to reveal to me? The Lord does not answer our questions just because of mere curiosity. To ask with real intent means I intend to do, follow, and believe in whatever it is that the Lord reveals. This principle is brought out in Moroni 10.4, quote, And when ye shall receive these things, I would exhort you that you would ask God, the Eternal Father, in the name of Christ, if these things are not true. The things in the Book of Mormon, the atonement that is talked about of Christ in the Book of Mormon, and the doctrine of Christ. Back to the quote. And if you will ask with a sincere heart, with real intent, having faith in Christ, he will manifest the truth of it unto you by the power of the Holy Ghost. If you have no intentions on believing in and acting upon the truth found in the Book of Mormon, Mormon, meaning having not having real intent, then why should the Lord answer my prayer about its truthfulness? You will not get an answer if you are not going to act upon the truth God reveals. 
James 1, 8, a double-minded man. Double-mindedness refers to fickleness, being non-committal and wavering in one's loyalty. Here in the epistle of James, it means to facil facilitate in one's commitment to the Lord. James 1, 9, let faithful saints who labor in menial positions in this life rejoice, for they shall inherit thrones and kingdoms in the world to come. James 10, 1, 10 through 11, let wealthy saints who are stripped of their goods because of their allegiance to the gospel also rejoice, for worldly riches are fleeting and not to be compared with the riches of eternity. Oh, let them rejoice when, through trials, they become lowly in spirit and no longer trust in those things with which wither and die in the day's heat. James 1, 9 through 11. The humblest, most faithful saint may receive exaltation. Wealth has been and always be a fleeting possession. In the Mediterranean subtropical climate of the land of Israel, the sun can beat down with merciless constancy. Summer days follow one another on and on with unrelenting cloudlessness. The sun's rays fall hard on the earth, scorching any seed or plant that has no root, causing it to wither away. James saw a parallel in the transitoriness of riches. Quote, for the sun is no sooner risen with the burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof faileth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also so the rich man fade away in his ways. James 1, 12 through 16 and 4, 7. Draw away after our own lusts and enticed. While God is known to test the faith of his children... See Genesis 21.1, DNC 101.3-5, and Abraham 3.25. He is not the source of temptation. James taught that temptation does not come from God, but from the devil, who attempts to draw us away from, the righteous, from righteousness by enticing us to do evil. The Greek verb from which draw away and enticed are translated refer to the traps and bait used when hunting and fishing. See James 1.14. Elder M. Russell Ballard of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught, quote, The use of artificial lures to, catch, to fool and catch a fish is an example of the way Lucifer, Lucifer often tempts, deceives, and tries to ensnare us. Like the fly fisherman who knows that trout are driven by hunger, Lucifer knows our hunger or weaknesses and tempts us with counterfeit lures which, if taken, can cause us to be yanked from the stream of life into his unmerciful influence. End of quote. The Joseph Smith translation, James 1, 12, teaches, Blessed is the man that resisteth temptation. That's James 1, 12, footnote B. Overcoming temptation is an essential and necessary part of working out one's salvation. Mortal man is by nature carnal, sensual, and devilish, see Alma 42, 10, meaning that he has an inherent and earthly inclination to succumb to the lust and passions of the flesh. This life is the appointed probationary estate in which it is being determined whether we will fall captive to temptation or rise above the allurement of the world, th worldly things so as to merit the riches of eternity. Christ himself was in all points tempted like as we are, yet he remained without sin. Adam was tempted of the devil, and yielded thereto found himself cast out of the Garden of Eden. And all accountable men since his day, in greater or lesser degree, have been overcome by temptation and become sinister. 1 John 1, 7-10 The atonement, the gospel, and the plan of salvation are designed to free men from past sins and give them power to resist temptation in the future. Temptation, though it exists, though its existence is essential to God's plan, is not of God, but it is of the devil. 
Alma 34, 39, and 3 Nephi 6, 17. The saints should always should pray always, lest they enter in temptation. 3 Nephi 18, 18, and DNC 61, 39. The meaning of the petition, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, in Matthew 6, 13, Luke 11, 4, and 3 Nephi 13, 12, is, suffer us not to be led into greater temptation than we can bear, but deliver us from the evil. Little children are without sin because power is not given unto sin. Satan to tempt little children until they begin to become accountable before me. Doctrine and Covenants 29 47. The three Nephites, having overcome and being sanctified in the flesh, are beyond the power of Satan, and he cannot tempt them. 3 Nephi 28 39. Similarly, when righteous saints go to paradise, they will no longer be tempted. But the wicked in hell are subject to the control and torments of Lucifer. Doctrine Covenants 132, 26. Can you see how we can progress much faster in the next life as long as we stay on the covenant path? Die on the covenant path. And when you reach paradise, you finally get Satan off of your back. And you're no longer tempted by him. Oh, how much faster we will then progress and become like our Savior. James 1, 17, no variableness with God. James Wright wrote that there is no variableness with God. Moroni similarly wrote that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And in him there is no variableness, neither shadow of changing. God's power is constant as his love for his children. This attribute of unchangeableness permits us to place our faith in him. James 1.18, the word of truth is the divine word which brought about the creation of man in God's image. James 1.19-20, be slow to wrath. James counseled, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Wrath is intense, vengeful anger, a characteristic that Paul described as one of the works of the flesh, Galatians 5, 19-20, or one of the characteristics of the fallen natural man. Wrath does not allow the Spirit of the Lord to flourish, and as James taught, does not achieve God's righteous purposes. For the wrath of man worketh not righteousness of God, James 1, 20. James 1, 21 superfluity or naughtiness. A part of his teaching that the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God, James 1.20, James exhorted his readers to lay apart all superfluity or naughtiness. Naughtiness has come to connote petty or mischievous acts, such as the pranks of children. But this is a very inadequate translation of the Greek word James used, which is kakios. This Greek word not only meant evil in a general sense, but specifically hatred or bitterness towards another. Thus, malice probably comes closest to the truest meaning. The Greek word translated superfluity is used in many other places in the New Testament. Typically, it is translated as abundance, which gives the true sense of James' phrase, abundance of malice. James 1, 22-25, Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only. It is oft-quoted passage, Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, James 1, 22. James taught readers that it is not sufficient to hear the word of God. The Lord expects us to act upon gospel truths. The epistle of James focuses largely on helping readers to become doers of the world. President Dallin H. Oaks of the First Presidency explained, quote, It is not enough to know that God lives, that Jesus Christ is our Savior, and that the gospel is true. We must take the high road by acting upon that knowledge. End of quote. James 1.23, A man beholding his natural face in a glass. In James 1.23, the word glass refers to a polished metal surface that was used as a mirror. 
James compared those who deceived themselves by hearing God's word but neglecting to act in righteousness to those who see their own reflection in a mirror and then forget how they looked. Elder Bruce R. McConkie added this insight, quote, to hear and not do, to seek salvation slowly through the word, the good word, of Christ without personal conformity to his laws is to see a glimpse of what salvation is in a mirror without ever receiving the real thing. End of quote. James 1.25, the perfect law of liberty. The fullness of the everlasting gospel, which is found on the principle of agency, the principle that men are free to choose their own course, to choose liberty and eternal life through the great mediation of all men, or to choose captivity and death according to the captivity and power of the devil. 2 Nephi 2.27 James 1.27, Pure Religion James observed that caring for others, particularly widows and the fatherless, is a manifestation of pure religion. Anciently, widows and orphans were among the most underprivileged members of society and had few rights or opportunities. Thus, the Lord repeatedly commanded his people to care for them and for others in great need. While serving in the presidency of the Seventy, Elder Earl C. Tingey pleaded with church members to care for the widows around them. Quote, the term widows is used 34 times in the scriptures. In 23 of these passages, the term refers to widows and the fatherless. I believe the Lord has a tender feeling towards widows and fatherless or orphans. He knows that they may have to rely more on, completely on him than on others. To the family and friends of widows, God knows of your service, and he may judge your works by how well you assist the widow. I know that the leaders of the church are concerned about the welfare of widows. We members should care for and assist the widows within our family, home, ward, and neighborhood. End of quote. The Joseph Smith translation of James 1.27 changes the end of the verse to read as, quote, and to keep himself unspotted from the vices of the world. That's James 1.27 footnote G. This is accomplished by keeping the Sabbath day holy. Notice what Doctrine and Covenants 59, 9-16 says, And that thou mayest more fully keep thyself unspotted from the world. So if I want to be unspotted and become sanctified, thou shalt go to the house of prayer and offer up thy sacraments upon my holy day. For verily this is a day appointed unto you to rest from your labors and to pay the devotions unto the Most High. Nevertheless, thy vow shall be offered up in righteousness on all days and at all times. But remember that on this, the Lord's day, thou shalt offer thine oblations and thy sacraments unto the Most High, confessing thy sins unto thy brethren and before the Lord. And on this day thou shalt do none other thing. Only let thy food be prepared with singleness of heart, that thy fasting may be perfect, or in other words, that thy joy may be full. Verily, this is fasting and prayer, or in other words, rejoicing and prayer. And inasmuch as ye do these things with thanksgiving, with cheerful hearts and countenances, not with much laughter, for this is sin, but with a glad heart and a cheerful countenance, verily I say that inasmuch as ye do this, the fullness of the earth is yours, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the air, and that which climbeth upon the trees and walketh upon the earth. End of quote. Keeping the law of the Sabbath will affect the production of our earth. To heck with climate change, brothers and sisters. Let's try climate change by keeping the Sabbath day holy. Not carbon emission nonsense, but this verse specifically tells us that you will have all that you need in the earth. It will not be destroyed if we will but keep the Sabbath day holy. Let's go to James chapter 2. God has chosen the poor of this world, of this world rich in faith. 
James 2, 1 through 9, with respect of persons. To have respect of persons means to show partiality or favoritism towards individuals. The Joseph Smith translation in James 1, 2, 1 clarifies, quote, My brethren, you cannot have the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, and yet have respect of persons. James 2, 1, footnote A. James condemned such biased treatment of others, specifically discrimination against the poor in favor of the rich. See James 2, 2 through 6. Other scriptures teach that followers of Christ should not discriminate on the basis of skin color, social standing, gender, or nationality, education, or economic standing, clothing, or health, age, or religious affiliation. By living in this way, we become more like Heavenly Father, who is no respecter of persons. President Gordon B. Hinckley stated, quote, We must never forget that we live in a world of great diversity. The people of the earth are all our Father's children and are of many and varied religious persuasions. We must cultivate tolerance and appreciation and respect one another. We have difference of doctrines. This need not bring about animosity or any kind of holier-than-thou attitude. End of quote. To exhort his readers to treat all people, both rich and poor, with charity, James quoted from Leviticus 19.18 that says, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, labeling it the royal law, James 2.8. Royal means belonging to a king. This teaching parallels Jesus' commandment to love the Lord thy God and to love thy neighbor as thyself. Those who keep the royal law love everyone and avoid showing favoritism. James 2, 4, partiality. Better translation would be divided between Christian duty and worldly interests. The phrase judges of evil thoughts, better translated evil thinking judges. This is also brought about by the Joseph Smith translation of James 2, 4. See footnote 8, which says, Are ye not then in yourselves partial judges and become evil in your thoughts? By showing undue preference to the rich man you judge and judge wrongly as to the relative merits of the rich and poor man. See 4, 11. God, the just judge, gives great honor to the pious poor man. He is an heir of the kingdom. James 2, 5 through 6. Riches are a curse and not a blessing when they lead men to live after the manner of the world and treat others with partiality. See James 1, 5 through 6. James 2, 7. That worthy name by which ye are called meaning the name of Christ, which all saints take upon themselves in the waters of baptism. Mosiah 5, 8-9 says, There is no other name given whereby salvation cometh. Therefore, I would that you should take upon you the name of Christ, all ye that have entered into the covenant with God, that ye should be obedient unto the end of your lives. And it shall come to pass that whosoever doeth this shall be found at the right hand of God. For he shall know the name by which he is called, for he shall be called by the name of Christ. James 2, 8-9 those who, those who obey the royal law to love their neighbor as themselves are free from the sin of partiality. James 2, 10-11 Salvation comes by obedience to the whole law of the gospel. Joseph Smith said, quote, any person who is exalted to the highest mansion has to be able to live celestial law and the whole law too, end of quote. Thus a man may be damned for a single sin. He may have a testimony, serve a mission, pay his tithing, have integrity in his business dealings, keep the Sabbath day holy, and on and on, through all the standards of personal righteousness. But if he commits adultery, he loses his soul. A sinner may, of course, repent and get in harmony again if he has not sinned unto death. But the fact is that one sin without repentance damns, whereas obedience to the whole law is required for salvation. Quote 88.22, For he who is not able to abide the law of a celestial kingdom cannot abide a celestial glory. One of the saddest stories in all sacred writ is that of King David. 
the long years of devotion and obedience he lived as a man after the Lord's own heart, and then came the case of Uriah and his wife. And as a consequence, he had fallen from his exaltation and shall not att attend the celestial inheritance that otherwise would have been his. James 2.13, Mercy rejoiceth against judgment. Those who have been merciful shall rejoice in the day of judgment, for they shall have mercy restored again unto them. See Alma 41.12-15. through 15. Doctrine and Covenants 1.10 says, The Lord shall come to recompense unto every man according to his work, and measure to every man according to the measure which he has measured to his fellow man. So how you have been so as you have treated others, so shall you be treated by the Lord. James two fourteen through twenty without faith without works is dead. James responded to reports of people who were speaking simplistically of faith as something separate from one's actions or works. See James 2, 14 through 16. It may be that the Apostle Paul's teachings were being distorted as they circulated orally among members of the church. Paul had emphasized that salvation came through faith in Jesus Christ and not through works or Samaritan ceremonial performances of the law of Moses. You need to remember, when Paul talks about the law, he's not talking about the law of the gospel. He's talking about the law of Moses, which has no power to save anyone. James used the term works in a different manner than Paul, referring to righteous deeds as the natural expression of belief. In response to those who suggested one could have faith and not have works, James asked, Can faith save him? The Greek text of this phrase contains an article before faith. James meant, Can think of, can that kind of faith save him? James was not teaching that faith has no saving power. He was teaching that a passive belief that results in no action was not true saving faith. When James challenged his readers to show me thy faith without thy works, James 2.18, he was pointing out that it is not possible to show one's faith except through one's actions. True faith cannot exist apart from righteous works. It cannot be just lip service. That's why we keep the commandments. They do not save us, brothers and sisters. If keeping the gospel and the commandments and going to the temple and going on missions, all that saved us, we wouldn't need a Savior. What they do is they show our faith in Christ, and then through that faith, Christ's atonement can then sanctify us. In lectures on faith, we read that faith is not only the principle that principle of action, but of power also in all intelligent beings, whether in heaven or on earth. Com commenting on this, Elder David A. Bednar taught, quote, thus faith in Christ leads to righteous action, which increases our spiritual capacity and power. Understanding that faith is a principle of action and of power inspires us to exercise our moral agency in compliance with gospel truth, invites the, re the, re in invites the redeeming and strengthening powers of the Savior's atonement into our lives and enlarges the power within us, whereby we are agents unto ourselves. End of quote. James 2.14, though a man say, this is only a claim to faith, not the real thing. For as instance, the claim of those who think they have faith, but falsely suppose they are safe by belief alone without works. The phrase, can faith save him? Not the false claim to faith, not the presumption that there can be faith without miracles and good works attending. James 2, 15 through 17, a perfect illustration. There is no more power in faith that does not include works than there is strength in food that is not eaten, or warmth in clothes that are not worn. 
Verse 17, faith is dead phrase means a dead faith equates with a dead God. Dead things do not exist. The language is used here simply for purpose of analysis and comparison, to show the absurdity of claiming faith where there are no works. The true doctrine is God lives and faith lives, and signs shall follow living faith down to the latest day. James 2.20 Jesus clearly taught that it is not enough to profess belief, but he that doeth the will of my Father is the one who is justified. The parable at the end of the Sermon on the Mount pointedly illustrates that truth. I apologize for that typo. That should be one instead of on. Joseph Smith's translation of James chapter 2, verses 14-20 has some significant changes and clarifications. Joseph Smith's translation, James 2.15 says, So you think you can have faith without works? If so, show it to me. Where is it? How does it operate? What power does it have? Or is it an erethial nothingness, like the sectarian concept of God? Can it heal the sick or raise the dead? For these are works. Nay, your faith is dead. It does not exist. Come rather, and I will show you my faith, which hath works. Give heed why I say unto Mount Zirin, Remove, and it shall be removed. Ether 12.30 Did not he who said, By their fruits, works, ye shall know them? Matthew 7.20 Say also, If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall be Remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Matthew seventeen twenty. Where are the fruits of your faith? The Joseph Smith translation of James two eighteen says, "You cannot be saved by faith that has no works." The Joseph Smith translation of two nineteen is, "It is the doctrine of the devil to believe that there can be faith without works." When the devil believes. Even the devil believes in God, and those who so think without more are likened to them and are not justified. See, the problem with Satan is he has no faith. He has no works. He does nothing to show his faith. He believes Christ. He has a testimony. He, he can bear a pure testimony of the true reality of Jesus as the Christ and Son of God. But he has no faith because he has no works. James 2, 21-25, the works of Abraham and Rahab, both James and Paul cite the Old Testament prophet Abraham as an important example of faith and good works. Abraham's willingness to carry out the command to offer up Isaac was a validation of his faith in God. Abraham becomes so great that he was called a friend of God. The Savior said his disciples would be his friends if they did whatsoever he commanded them. Action is critical to faith. Like Abraham, the harlot Rahab also demonstrated her faith through her actions. See Hebrews 11.3. She was an inhabitant of Jericho at the time the armies of Israel, under Joshua's leadership, approached the promised land. See Joshua 2. Joshua sent two men into Jericho to spy out the strength of the city. Rahab took the spies in and hid them when the king sought for them. Then she helped them to escape safely from the city. For her actions, she and her family were spared when the rest of Jericho was destroyed, and she dwelt in Israel for the remainder of her life. See Joshua six twenty two through twenty five. James 2.26 This verse contains the same type of argument which Lehi used to show that if there were no law, there could be no sin, righteousness, happiness, punishment, nor misery, nor God, nor creation, nor mortal men, and therefore all things must have vanished away. 2 Nephi 2.13 it is an argument so persuasive in nature that it is an end to all contention. As used by James, it is in effect, work, without works, faith is dead. The body is dead. God is dead. There is nothing. All things have vanished away. Or, if ye shall say there are no works, ye shall say there is no faith. And if there is no faith, there is no salvation. Salvation comes by faith. 
And if there is no salvation, there is no redemption. And if there is no redemption, there is no Christ and no God. And if these things are not, there is no creation, and we are not, and all things have vanished away. Let's now turn to James chapter 3. By governing the tongue, we gain perfection. James 3, 1, 2, 10, the tongue is a fire. James warned the saints at the potential ruin that unkind words, inappropriate language, or the loss of one's temper can cause. To help readers recognize the importance of speaking with care, he compelled the mouth and the tongue to a horse bit, a ship's rudder, fire, and poison. The strength of a horse is directed by a small bit placed in its mouth. James counseled readers to carefully watch their words to become a perfect man. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles quoted James 3, 2 through 10, and then expressed the following about harsh or hurtful speech. Quote, Obviously, James doesn't mean our tongues are always iniquitous, nor that everything we say is full of deadly poison. But he clearly means that at least some things we say can be destructive, even venomous, than that and that is a chilling indictment for a latter-day saint. The voice that bears profound testimony, others fervent prayers, and sings the hymns of Zion can be the same voice that berates and criticizes, embarrasses and demeans, inflicts pain and destroys the spirit of oneself and of others in the process. Husbands, you have been entrusted with the greatest sacred gift God can give you, a wife, a daughter of God, the mother of your children, who has voluntarily given herself to you for love and joy, for companionship. Think of the kind of things you said when you were courting. Think of the blessings you have given with hands placed lovingly upon her head, and then reflect on other moments characterized by cold, caustic, unbridled words. A husband would never dream of striking his wife physically, can break, if not her bones, then certainly her heart by the brutality of thoughtless or unkind speech. Wives, what of the unbridled tongue in your mouth, of the power of good or ill in your words? How is it that such a lovely voice could ever in turn be so shrill, so biting, so acrid and untamed? A woman's words can be more piercing than any dagger ever forged, and they can drive the people they love to retreat beyond a barrier more distant than anyone in the beginning of that exchange could have ever imagined. End of quotation. Two gospel scholars of ancient scripture, Ogden and Skinner, relate, a modern general authority has said, whenever you get red in the face, whenever you raise your voice, whenever you get hot under the collar, or angry, rebellious, or negative in spirit, then know that the Spirit of God is leaving you, and the Spirit of Satan is beginning to take over. That is something truly to contemplate. James 3, verse 1, Strive not for the mastery, meaning dominion, power of governing or commanding. James cautions against seeking to be masters because of the great condemnation that could attend, James 3, 1. Later he adds, To him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin, James 4, 17. That position and knowledge brings responsibility is taught repeatedly in the scriptures. Quote, for unto him, for unto him unto whom much is given, much is required. And he who sins against the greater light receives the greater condemnation. DNC 82.23. Helaman 14, 19, Therefore repent ye, repent ye, lest ye knowing these things and not doing them, ye shall suffer yourselves to come under condemnation. Quote, For the atonement satisfy the demands of justice upon all those who have not the law given to them. But woe unto him that has the law given, yea, that has all the commandments like unto us, and that transgresseth them, and that wasteth the days of his probation. For awful is his state. Second Nephi 9, 26-27. James 3, 2. Worldly men are often vulgar, profane, dishonest in speech. Even the saints are sometimes harsh, intemperate, and unwise in their conversation. 
James 3, 5 through 6. A single spark may become a blazing inferno and burn a whole forest, and the tongue that uses improper language is as the igniting spark. It defiles the whole body and burns the whole being of man. Verse 6, the phrase on fire of hell meaning a figurative way of saying that the source of the tongue's evil is the devil. James 3, 9, since man has been like, made like God, to curse man is like cursing God. See Genesis 9, 6. Now, that is something to keep in mind. James 3, 10 through 13, Mormon uses the same reasoning to show that a man being evil cannot do that which is good. For behold, a bitter fountain cannot bring forth good water, neither can a good fountain bring forth bitter water. Wherefore, a man being a servant of the devil cannot follow Christ, and if he follow Christ, he cannot be a servant of the devil. Moroni 7, 6 through 11. James admonished those who use their mouths to bless and to curse that these things ought not so to be. James 3, 10. The language we, we use reveals what is in our heart. James 3, 11 through 13. For in the strength of youth, church leaders have offered guidelines to help us avoid destructive speech. Quote, how you communicate should reflect who you are as a son or daughter of God. Clean and intelligent language is evident of a bright and wholesome mind. Always use the name of God and Jesus Christ with reverence and respect. Misusing the name of deity is a sin. Do not pr use profane, vulgar, or crude language or gestures, and do not tell jokes or stories about immoral actions. These are offensive to God and to others. If you have developed a habit of using language that is not keeping with these standards, such as swearing, mocking, gossip gossiping, or speaking in anger to others, you can change. Pray for help. Ask your family and friends to support you and your desire to use good language. End of quote. Some questions we might want to consider. How can these, influ how can these verses influence the way we speak to others? And another question you may want to contemplate, in what ways could you improve in this area? James 3, 14, envying and strife. Envying, resentment, and discontentment over the excellence or good fortune of another, and strife, which is contention for superiority, are of the devil. They lead away from God and his goodness and impedes men from acquiring those attributes which enable them to be like him. And desire for superiority is the quintessential characteristic of Satan. Remember, he wanted to he wanted to have God's position and to become more than God, superior over him. See Moses 4, 1. James 3, 15 through 17. Verse 15, the phrase wisdom not from above, and then verse 17, again, wisdom from above. James here is making the same distinction found in the writings of various of the prophets. There is one form of wisdom that is of God, another that is from beneath. One that is true and invaluable in the eternal perspective, another that is false and counterfeit and leads away from salvation. Jacob speaks of the wise and the learned, and they that are rich, who are puffed up because of their learning and their wisdom and their riches, and says that they are despised by the Lord, and that, quote, the things of the wise and the prudent should be hid from them forever. Second Nephi 9, 42-43. Paul is even more explicit. He says the wisdom of the world is foolishness with God, and that faith cannot stand on this wisdom of men. Quoting 1 Corinthians 1, 17 through 31 and 2, 1 through 16. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, he says, yet not the wisdom of this world, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. James 3, 18, of them that make peace. Better translated by peacemakers. The wise man is a peacemaker who sows good seed that in God's time will bear precious fruit. James 3, 17 through 18 to sum up. The heavenly wisdom is one 
chaste, pure in relation to its possessor, too peaceable in its relation to others, actively reasonable and passively easy to be persuaded, three, practical, full of piety and good works, and four, certain of itself without doubtfulness and therefore without hypocrisy. Wisdom, in James' view, is moral rather than an intellectual quality. I would say that wisdom is the righteous application of truth. James chapter 4, wars are born of lust. James 4 verse 1, wars come because of a desire to steal, to plunder, to take another man's goods. They come because of a desire for sex immorality, for power, for fame, and for wealth. There are no great international principles at stake. There are no earth-shaking earth reasons for combat. Any such are simply excuses. It is not nations of people and races of men that rise up to battle because of some irresistible need to take up the sword against another nations and kingdoms. Wars are simply quarreling and fighting in a magnified and organized form. They are born of lust and inspired by the devil. Satan is a warrior. In heaven and on earth he rebels and fights because war destroys souls and hinders the work of righteousness. They are no different in principle from fighting and contention among individuals. James 4.2 Men seek to gratify the lust of the flesh through contention and war, but still do not gain their desire. Whereas if they would ask of God, he would give them all that is proper and right. James 4, 3, the phrase, because ye ask a myth. James observed that prayers are inappropriate if one's intent is just to just is if one's intent is just to satisfy improper desires. Doctrine and Covenants 88, 64 through 65 states. Quote, Wherefore ye shall ask the Father in my name, and it shall be given unto you, that that is expedient for you. And if ye shall ask anything that is not expedient for you, it shall turn to your condemnation. Elder Neil A. Maxwell of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught that we must seek the guidance of the Holy Ghost in order to avoid asking amiss. Quote, God sees things as they really are and as they will become. We don't. In order to tap that precious perspective during our prayers, we must rely upon the promptings of the Holy Ghost. With access to that kind of knowledge, we would then pray for what we and others should have, really have. With the Spirit prompting us, we will not ask amiss. The true order of prayer is getting the Holy Ghost to tell you what to say, and then you repeat it in your prayers. James 4, verse 4, the phrase, ye adulterers and adulteresses, literally those guilty of sexual immorality, figuratively those who have forsaken the Lord. The phrase, enmity with God, meaning the Lord has his friends and his enemies. When people serve him with full purpose of heart, they become his friends, and they are the ones he shall take with him into his kingdom, and with whom he shall associate forever. His enemies, on the other hand, are those who oppose his work, who fight the truth, who live carnal and sensual lives, and advocate those principles and practices which debase men, who commit sin and live after the manner of the world. The natural man is an enemy to God. James 4, 5-6 through 6, The spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy. There is no scripture to this effect in our Old Testament, in our present Old Testament. As here given, the meaning must be that man in his mortal probation is subject to envy and other lust. I apologize for that topo that he should be be. God longeth eagerly for the spirit that he planted in us. James is here alluding to several passages in the Old Testament rather than quoting accurately. The thought is found in Exodus 25, 34, 14, and Deuteronomy 4, 24. Verse 6, the phrase, but he giveth more grace, meaning God is a jealous God. 
but his jealous love is very different from that of man. It shows itself in the good gift of more grace. He longs that the spirit of man should be drawn more closely to him and become like him through humility. Having won the saints, at least through sin and apostasy, they become friends of the world and therefore enemies of God. James now enumerates what they must do to remain in grace and stand as friends of deity. After extending the gospel and thereby gaining an introduction, as it were, to the Lord in heaven, it is simply a matter of earning and acquiring the attributes of godliness so as to feel at ease in the divine presence. And so James, in language of majestic simplicity, enumerates some of the simple, I'm sorry, some of the principles of conduct which grow out of the doctrines of the gospel. James 4, 7, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Resist the devil and he will have no power over you. All of the prophets and righteous men, even our Lord himself included, are or were confounded and tempted by Lucifer. It is not until men dwell in celestial burnings that the devil, unable to stand the glory of such a world, flees from them in the true and ultimate sense of the world. James 4, 8, draw near unto God by having clean hands, meaning your actions, and purify your hearts, meaning your desires, by choosing to follow Christ and not becoming double-minded. Doctrine and Covenants 88.63 says, Draw near unto me, and I will draw near unto you. Seek me diligently, and ye shall find me. Ask, and ye shall receive. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. James 4.9, Weep as Jesus did over doomed Jerusalem. Luke 19.41-44, For the sins of men. And be willing to endure hardship and suffer harassment. See verse 9, footnote A. James 4.10, Seek humility without being compelled by circumstance. Matthew 23.12 says, And whatsoever shall exalt, or whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. James 4.11-12, Judging the brethren, speaking evil against the saints, is in effect judging the gospel and evil speaking against its laws. For the gospel reserves judgment to the Lord. Thus those who presume to judge others usurp the prerogatives of deity, of him only who has power to impose sentence, that is, to save and to destroy. We have no right to condemn anyone, that is, unrighteous judgment. I have no right to make assumptions about someone and contend them. I have a right to judge actions and not participate in unrighteous actions, but only that. Elder Creel Colford spoke of the need to speak well of others. Quote, what a blessing it would be if, if each of our names truly could be safe in the homes of others. Have you noticed how easy it is to find fault with other people? All too often we seek to be excused from the very behavior we condemn in others. Mercy for me, justice for everyone else, is a much too much common addiction. When we deal with the name and reputation of another, we deal with something sacred in the sight of the Lord. There are those among us who would recoil in horror at the thought of stealing another person's money or property, but who don't give a second thought to stealing another person's good name or reputation. James, a servant of the Lord in the meridian of time, repeated this eternal truth when he said, Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil is his brother, and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law, and judgeth the law. Who art thou? that judgeth another. End of quote. James 4, 13 through 16. Verse 13. Those who have taken upon themselves the name of Christ, who have joined his family, who have chosen him as their father, are now subject to family discipline. They are no longer free to go and come at will. They must conform to the family pattern of life. Verse 14. Their goings and comings 
and doings are now subject to the will of the Lord, their new father. They may plan their own affairs as long as those do not run counter to what the Lord may have in mind. Verse 15, but his preferences prevail. He may want to, them to go on a proselyting mission, to serve in a bishopric, to preserve, to preside over elders' quorums. Verse 16, their obligation is to put first in their lives the things of his kingdom. James 4, 17, what is sin? John, sin, John said, all unrighteousness is sin. 1 John 5, 17. Also, whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. 1 John 3, 4. Paul taught whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Romans 14, 23. James explained to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is sin. James 4, 17. It should be noted that all of these statements were addressed to members of the church who had received the gospel law. Elder Orson F. Whitney made this explanation, quote, Sin is the transgression of divine laws as made known through the con conscience or by revelation. A man sins when he violates his conscience, going contrary to the light and knowledge, not the light and knowledge that has come to his neighbor, but that which has come to himself. He sins when he does the opposite of what he knows to be right. Up to that point, he only blunders. One may suffer painful consequences for only blundering, but he cannot commit sin unless he knows better than to do the thing in which the sin consists. One must have a conscience before he can violate it. Wherefore, there is no law given where there is no punish, punishment, and where there is no punishment, there is no condemnation. That's 2 Nephi 9.25. He that knoweth not good from evil is blameless. Alma 29.5. Sin cannot be committed unless laws are ordained. Alma 42.17. And unless people have knowledge of those laws so that they can violate them, Adam and Eve could not commit sin while in the Garden of Eden, although the laws of conduct had already been established because the knowledge, the knowledge of good and evil had not yet been given them. Unless they had partaken of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they would have remained in a state of innocence, having no joy, for they knew no misery, doing no good, for they knew no sin. Second Nephi 2. 23. President James E. Faust of the First Presidency explained, Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Love your neighbor as yourself. When smitten, turn the other cheek. When asked for a coat, give your cloak also. Forgive not just once, but seventy times seven. This was the essence of the new gospel Jesus taught. There was more emphasis on do than do not. I fear that some of our greatest sins are sins of omission. These are the thoughtful, caring deeds we fail to do and feel so guilty for having neglected them. End of quote. Let's turn to our last chapter, chapter 5, Misery Awaits the Wanton Rich. Elder Bruce R. McConkie wrote the following concerning the challenges of riches. Quote, As with all men, those who have riches will be judged according to their works and gain either salvation or damnation as they may have chance to merit. But the, na the nature of fallen man is such that in overwhelming majority of cases, riches are far more of a hindrance than a help in attaining peace in this world and eternal life in the world to come. According to prophets in all ages have warned against the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. See Mark 4, 19, Matthew 13, 22, and Luke 8, 14. Least men love the things of this world more than the riches of eternity and thereby lose their souls. End of quote. James 5, 1, ye rich men, meaning James is not condemning all rich men, rather those whose money is their God, who lay up treasures upon earth 
only and not in heaven, whose heart are set upon the things of this world. The righteous rich shall be saved. Relative to them, in counseling the Nephite saints, Jacob taught, quote, Think of your brethren like unto yourselves, and be familiar with all, and free with your substance, that they may be rich like unto you. But before ye seek for riches, seek ye for the kingdom of God. And after ye have obtained a hope in Christ, ye shall obtain riches if you seek them. And ye will seek them for the intent to do good, to clothe the naked, to feed the hungry, and to liberate the captive, and administer relief to the sick and the afflicted. Jacob 2, 17-19. The phrase, your miseries, James is referring to damnation. Woe unto you rich men that will not give your substance to the poor, for your riches will, riches will canker your souls, and this shall be your lamentation in the day of visitation, and of judgment, and of indignation. The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and my soul is not saved. Doctrine and Covenants 56, 16. James 5, 2 through 5, warning to the rich. Prophets have warned repeatedly against pride and the evils that often accompany wealth. James specifically identified three areas of concern. One, hoarding wealth. See James 5, 2 through 3. Meaning accumulating so much material wealth that it sits unused and decaying. Riches should be used to do good and work righteousness. Treasures heaped up against the days of trouble and peril shall perish. They become moth-eaten and rust away through disuse. Their loss bears witness of the selfishness of those who hoard them, in whose souls the fires of conscience shall burn, consuming, as it were, the very being. Two, failing to pay wages to employees. See verse 4. Three, living a luxurious and in a self-indulgent lifestyle. See verse 5. The day of slaughter, verse 5, may refer to the coming day of judgment. Much like cattle are fattened prior to their slaughter, so the wicked rich have fattened their hearts unaware of the coming judgment against them. In verse 4, James wrote that the cries of those defrauded by their deceitful employers are entered into the ears of the Lord Sabaot. Sabaot is the Hebrew word meaning host. Thus, the Lord of Sabaot, meaning lords of host, can also mean army, a host of army. So the Lord of army. God is a God of war. He is waging a righteous war here in mortality. James 5, through six, 5, verse 6. How often do riches and the worldly power they beget set the stage for slaying of the prophets? The phrase the just, James specifically, Christ, generally all the martyrs of true religion, all the innocent blood shed upon the earth, all the prophets and saints who lay down their lives for the love of God and the testimony of Jesus. James 5, 7 through 8. Early and later reigns. Paul is referring to farmers in ancient Israel awaited patiently for the early rain of the planting season, which helped a seed to sprout and to grow, and for the later rain, which helped plants to mature prior to harvesting. James used this imagery to teach that, like the farmer who must patiently tend the field and wait for the rains and eventual harvest, the righteous are to patiently preach the gospel and nurture one another, knowing that salvation will eventually come. Elder Bruce R. McConkie provided an additional insight concerning the earlier and later rains. Quote, Our Lord's return is like the planting and harvesting of crops by an husbandman. The seeds are sown at his first coming and are watered by the early rains so that they sprout and take root. Then after a long wait, attended by much patience and endurance on the part of the saints amid the latter rains, the rains that ripens the harvest, he comes again to pluck the fruit of his vineyard and to reign on earth a thousand years with those who have kept the faith. 
The early rain fell at sowing time. The later rain came to mature the crop for harvest. Thus the heavens rained righteousness when our Lord ministered among mortal men in time's meridian. And also there shall be a great day of revelation and refreshment and restoration when truth shall spring out of the earth and righteousness shall look down from heaven. End of quote. We are living during that time. Truth has sprung out of the earth. The Book of Mormon has come from out of the earth. And righteousness, meaning revelation of the latter days, has looked down from heaven and will continue to do so. James 5, 9, grudge not against another. It is one thing to bear up under the wrongs of the wicked. It is sometimes is quite another to rise above offenses given by one's fellow saints. Hence the counsel, do not, mumber, mum, do not murmur or grumble or manifest harsh judgment against the brethren. James 5, 10 through 11, the prophets are examples of how to endure afflictions. James cited Israel's prophets as an example of the patience, patient endurance that all saints must have as they wait the second coming of Jesus Christ. In our day, Elder Robert D. Hells of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles specifically identified the prophet Joseph Smith as an example of being patient in times of afflictions. Quote, in our dispensation, the prophet Joseph Smith endured all manner of opposition and hardship to bring to pass the desire our heavenly the, the desire of our Heavenly Father, the restoration of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Joseph was harassed and hunted down by angry mobs. He patiently endured poverty, humiliation, humiliating ch charges, and unkind acts. His people were forcibly driven from town to town, from state to state. He was tarred and feathered. He was falsely charged and jailed. Joseph knew if, that if he were to stop going forward with this great work, his earthly trials would probably ease. But he could not stop because he knew who he was. He knew for what purpose he was placed on earth. And he had the desire to do God's will. End of quote. Brethren, that is how we, and sisters, that is how we are going to get through our trials and for afflictions. We have to know who we are and what our purpose is down here on earth and what God's will is for us. That is the only way we will be able to endure tribulation. To fill the measure and purpose of our mortal probation, we must have patience. This mortal existence is the Lord's sifting sphere, the time when we are subject to trials, testing, and tribulations. Future rewards will be based upon our patient endurance of all things. The patience of the saints consists in bearing or enduring pains, trials, and persecutions, even unto death, without complaint and without equanimity, meaning evenness of mind. It was the master himself who said, In your patience possess ye your souls, Luke twenty one nineteen. And anyone who yields his soul and being to the Lord becometh a child, submissive, meek, humble, patient, full of love, willing to submit to all things which the Lord seeth fit to inflict upon him, even as a child does submit to his father. Mosiah three nineteen. Patience also involves, involves an exercise of forbearance under provocation as illustrated in the celestial principle, whosoever shall smite thee on the right sheet, turn to him the other also. Patience and righteousness leads to perfection and eternal life. Thus Paul wrote that by patient continuance and well-doing, the saints seek for glory and honor and immortality and eternal life, Romans 2.7. And by revelation in our day, the Lord commanded, continue in patience until you are perfected, D.N.C. 67.13. And seek the face of the Lord always, that in patience you may possess your souls and ye shall have eternal life, Doctrine and Covenants 101, verse 38. James 5.12, in ancient dispensations, particularly the Mosaic, the taking of oath was an approval or a formal part of religious lives of the people. These oaths were solemn appeals to deity or to some sacred object or thing 
in att attestation of the truth of a statement or of a sworn determination to keep a promise. These statements usually made in the name of the Lord by people who valued their religion and their word above their lives could be and were relied upon with absolute assurance. Beginning in the meridian of times, Jesus revealed a higher standard relative to truthfulness in conversation. It was, it was simply that yea meant yea, and nay meant nay, and that no oath was required to establish the verity of any promise or thing. Every man's, every man's every word was to be as true and accurate as if it had been spoken with an oath. James 5, 13 through 16, a ministering to the sick. James 5, 13 through 16 provides evidence that the anointing the sick with oil so that they might be healed was practiced by authorized servants of the Lord in the early Christian church. President Dallin H. Oates explained the modern practice of the anointing of the sick with oil. Quote, when someone has been anointed by the authority of the Melchizedek priesthood, the anointing is sealed by that same authority. To seal something means to affirm it, to make it binding for its intended purpose. When elders anoint a sick person and seal the anointing, they open the heaven, windows of heaven for the Lord to pour forth the blessing he wills for the purse afflicted. Remember the phrase, the blessing he wills for the person afflicted. Continuing uh, Elder or President Oaks. President Brigham Young taught, When I lay hands on the sick, I expect the healing power and influence of God to pass through me to the patient and the disease to give way. When we are prepared, then we are holy vessels before the Lord. A stream of power from the Almighty can pass through the tabernacle of the administrator to the system of the patient, and the sick are made whole. Faith is essential for healing by the power of heaven. The Book of Mormon even teaches that if there be no faith among the children of men, God can do no miracles among them. Ether 12, 12. In a notable talk on administering to the sick, President Spencer W. Kimball said, The need of faith is often underestimated. The ill one and the family often seem to de depend wholly on the power of the priesthood and the gift of the healing that they hope the administering brethren may have. Whereas the greater responsibility is with him who is blessed. The major element is the faith of the individual when that person is conscious and accountable. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Matthew 9.22 was, was repeated so often by the master that it almost became a chorus. End of President Oaks. Quote. As we, <coughs> excuse me, as we exercise the undoubted power of the priesthood of God, as we treasure his promise that he will hear and answer the prayer of faith, we must always remember that faith and the healing of the priesthood cannot produce a result contrary to the will of him whose priesthood it is. James also made a connection between the healing of the sick and forgiveness of sins. See James 5.15. This statement may be based on the principle that the humility and faith required for a person to be healed are the same required for a person to be receive forgiveness. Elder Bruce R. McConkie stated that, quote, the person who by faith, devotion, righteousness, and personal worthiness is in a position to be healed is also in a position to have the justifying approval of the Spirit for his course of life and his sins are forgiven him, as witnessed by the fact that he receives the companionship of the Spirit which he could not have if he were unworthy. End of quote. James 5, 17-18, Elias prayed. The Old Testament account does not say that Elias prayed, but such is implicit in the miraculous event that attended his word, 1 Kings 17 and 18. The fact is that faith and prayer and mighty pleading with the Lord are the usual and normal accompaniments of miracles. James 5.20, he which co converteth the sinner. In James we read, he who converteth the sinner from the error of his ways shall have 
shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. James 5.20 James taught that when a sinner is converted and receives the ordinance of salvation, his sins are hidden, covered, or forgiven through the atonement of Jesus Christ, and he is saved from spiritual death. Latter-day Revelation provides the additional insight that the person who assisted in bringing about the conversion can also receive a remission of his sins. See DNC 62.3. Spencer W. W. Kimball affirmed this truth, quote, The Lord has told us that our sins will be forgiven more readily as we bring souls unto Christ and remain steadfast in bearing testimony to the world. And surely every one of us is looking for additional help in being forgiven of our sins. See Doctrine and Covenants 8461. In one of the greatest of missionary scriptures, section 4 of the Doctrine and Covenants, we are told that if we serve the Lord in missionary service with all our heart, might, mind, and strength, then we may stand blameless before God at the last day. That's Doctrine and Covenants section 4, verse 2. End of President Kimball's quote. Thank you for watching. I hope you gained some great insights concerning the teachings of James and how we need to put our faith in Christ and show that faith through our actions and our deeds and not just through lip service. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button.